Welcome to Today at Wayne, a podcast that engages and informs the Wayne State University campus community. With news, announcements, information, and current events discussions relevant to the university's goals and mission, Today at Wayne serves as the perfect forum for our campus to begin a conversation or keep one going. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Today at Wayne podcast. I'm Daryl Dawsey. While the early brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic was largely felt by American adults, the virus has always posed unique threats to children. And now as the surge in cases in 2021 show just how much children can be physically vulnerable to the virus, we are also learning just how much of a toll the outbreak has taken on kids' mental health. Researchers at Wayne State University recently published a study titled, Are the Kids Really All Right? Impact of COVID-19 on Mental Health in a Majority Black American Sample of School Children, which focused on mental health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic in a group of elementary age children from two public schools and one private school, all located in urban areas with high, high infection rates in suburban Detroit. The results showed that a child's fear of getting COVID-19 or having a loved one contract the virus increased over time, independent of race and socioeconomic status. So what are the long-term implications of this study? And how do we address the mental health issues in children that arise from the pandemic? Here to speak to these and other questions is a co-author of the study, Hilary Marusak, PhD, who also works as Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at WSU. Welcome, Professor Marusak. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. So um, let's jump into it. Tell me a little bit about the origins of your study, how it began. I know that it didn't study, it, it didn't set out to study uh, how these kids were impacted by COVID-19. So what were, what were the early origins of that study? Yeah, I think um, nobody expected this, um, but um, yeah, it was one of the things that we just couldn't ignore. We actually had a study going on prior to the onset of the pandemic. And um, this is actually pretty rare to have you know, data on baseline or sort of pre-pandemic mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, Typically with disasters like COVID-19, we could characterize that as a disaster. Um, We study, you know, families and children after the onset of those things. And we ask them to kind of retrospectively recall, you know, how they were doing before the pandemic. But obviously, you know, my memory is not great. I can't remember what I did yesterday. So it's not super reliable to do it that way. So in this study, we actually had the unique opportunity to look at how kids were actually doing before the pandemic and then afterwards. And again, as a developer, mental scientists, um, you know, we, we're not focused on COVID-19 in our research, but we certainly could not ignore the, Im- ignore the impact that it has on children and families. Let's talk about that. What, what has been the impact? What are, you know, what are the, the, the key findings from your study? What are the things that I guess we should most be alarmed by or concerned about? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think when people think COVID, they obviously think about the enormous um, physical effects it can have on folks. And um, I don't think they often think about kids because kids don't typically show a lot of physical symptoms from getting the virus. But psychologically, if we a- actually ask them how they're doing, which I don't think a lot of people um, do just like how kids are doing, you know, there's a lot going on under there. A lot of them have a lot of fears and concerns in the same way that uh, us adults do. And their concerns and fears may be similar or also different to what we see in adults. And I think it's just really important to actually ask them how they're feeling and what are they afraid of. And um, there are a couple of different things that stood out to us. Um, one of them was that kids were not super afraid that they would get the virus and have bad things happen to them. They were really concerned about loved ones. So their parents, their grandparents, you know, aunts and uncles, um, classmates, even people in the world, they were very concerned about um, people getting the virus and um, getting sick with it. And that fear actually increased over the time, over time. So we Um, surveyed kids a couple times during the pandemic. And the second time when they were getting close to school starting, um, they actually reported more fear of those things. So um, I I think fear is one of those things that is on a spectrum. And there were a lot of kids in the sample who had a little bit of fear, um, but a lot of kids who actually had really high fear, like they, they were afraid of this every single day. And again, we wouldn't have known that if we if we didn't actually ask kids about these things. That's it's really interesting as you say that. Why is it that you think we don't ask our children stuff like this? I mean, you know, we see this this once in a generation pandemic ravaging communities. I've read about things like you know the social services system 
being impacted. Certainly our schools have been impacted. Daycares have, daycare centers have been impacted. Why do you think it's just, you know, I mean, I understand that, you know, when the, when the virus hit a lot of the physical toll was obviously on adults, but why do you think we've overlooked kids so far this, this way? Yeah, well, I think it's, it must be hard as a parent and I'm only a fur parent, so I can't speak to what it actually, all the stress it is to be a, a human parent, but I think it's tricky with kids. I think they don't totally understand what's happening. And especially with the younger kids that, you know, we focused on elementary school age. So a lot of parents feel like they, they want to protect their kids and not share anything that might be too scary. And I completely understand that. Um, I think there's just, it's really unclear about, you know, how much we should share with them. And actually one of the things we didn't look at in, in this, we didn't publish in this study, but one of the things that we looked at was how parents are talking to their kid about the virus. So are they sharing their thoughts and their feelings? And that was actually more helpful. So parents who, um, you know, shared what was happening with the virus, like very evidence-based information, shared their, their thoughts and their feelings and showed their kid that they are also struggling. Um, those kids seem to be doing better, although that was unpublished data. So I thought that was just kind of interesting. What do we, um, what should we be concerned about long-term? What are the long-term potential implications here, particularly as it speaks to issues around anxiety, you know, uh, PTSD? What, what, what should we be thinking about for down the road? Yeah, great, great question. So there's always something we're thinking about is when fear persists and when it becomes problematic and chronic and it begins to interfere with daily life. And um, that's why I think, you know, just simply asking kids how they're doing and talking about these things and sharing your own feelings, you know, that's kind of step one is, is really seeing what's happening and identifying kids who might be struggling and, and need a little bit of extra help. And, you know, like you said, we're in a pandemic, so it would be weird to not have, you know, those feelings of anxiety and stress at some point. Um, it's just, we need, we do need to figure out who is, um, you know, on the higher end of things and make sure that it doesn't persist and it doesn't become um, debilitating and interfere with, you know, classwork and their family life. Now, you focused on uh, two particular communities in the metro area, Oak Park, Michigan, and Southfield, Michigan, uh, which are both predominantly African-American suburban enclaves right outside of Detroit. Um, but is this a, uh, are, are there reasons for us to think that this is an issue that we're seeing all over the country, not just in this particular region? Or is this something that, according to your research, would suggest this is unique to our particular area? Yeah, good question. Um, I, we weren't equipped to to answer whether this is different than like what happens say in Chicago or, or another city. But um, when we were looking at the data, um, we realized that there are very few studies about minority groups and how they're doing during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And at least here in Detroit, very early on in the pandemic, um, lower resource communities and um, Black American communities were hit hardest by the virus itself. So it just made sense for us to actually look at the psychological impact. And there wasn't any data and anyone talking in the literature about those communities. So uh, we felt that we needed to get the word out and actually look at how those communities are doing, given that um, they are especially vulnerable to disasters and pandemics. Yeah, well, it sounds like you're feeling a a very important uh, needed uh, informational void. Um, well, we're gonna get ready to wrap up, but I just wanna give you the opportunity to talk about anything maybe that we didn't discuss or that I didn't touch on, or are there, uh, you know, is there other work that uh, people should, should be aware of, or are there other aspects of the study that we should know about? What do you have to say in closing? Yeah, thanks for that. I think one thing I didn't mention yet was um, fears about social distancing or physical distancing, as, as it's been called. Um, that was really related to socioeconomic status. So kids who grew up in families with lower household income, for example, they felt a lot of fear about that. And what I'm talking about here is like fear of missing out on celebrations or birthdays, you know, not feeling like you're close with your friends. And I think what we're seeing there is really like a digital divide. And I can imagine like those, you know, the, the well-resourced families have more access to things like cell phones and iPads and ways to, to keep in touch with their family and their friends um, versus the kids who didn't have access to those things. I think that they really, you know, felt like they were missing out. And we know 
from um, decades of research at this point that that social connection is really important for not only um, brain development in kids, but also just, you know, us feeling like we have, um, you know, a community and it's important for mental well being. And I think there's a lot of talk about loneliness in adults. And I think that was one aspect of, of this study that really stood out to me was that loneliness can really be um, something that impacts kids' mental health. And we should also pay attention to that and making those extra um, efforts to really provide opportunities for the kids to connect with their, their classmates in a safe way. You got whole classes of kids who never experienced field trips and didn't go on their first school, go exactly. to their first school dance. And, you know, a lot of those kinds of things that milestones the yeah. process. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right. Well, Dr. Hillary Marusak, we, we want to thank you for joining us here on this Day at Wayne podcast. We really appreciate your time and we're looking forward to your next study. And the next time we can get you on the podcast to talk a little bit about it. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the Today at Wayne podcast. I'm Daryl Dawsey. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Today at Wayne. We'd love to hear from you, our campus community, about other podcast ideas and topics. What compelling things are you doing to spread the good word about living, learning, working, and playing like a warrior? Let us know by visiting todayatwayne.edu.